finally awake. What's popular YouTube? Another day, another demo. Today we have the number 16 player of 2022 on Laos top 20 of 2022. The list that complements HLTV's list, but doesn't try to compete with it. No, this is the list that I built based on all the games that I've watched, all the demos that I've watched this year. Finally, I've been casted, you know, both majors in a year. Been there for some of the big moments in person. Got to really feel the the, the magnitude of some of the shots that were hit and what it really meant to be there. And I, I want to make that, you know, just my huge amount of empirical data, first person information, being uh, having head casted and, and watched a lot of CS this year and try to make that what this list is is mostly about. Uh, of course, stats absolutely play a factor. Um, achievements and all that sort of thing matter a lot. I just want to make sure that this list has everybody who I think, based on who I saw, carved a place for themselves on their team and in this year as for that uh, kind of explain why it was them and not somebody else. I think that's the big theme of this list this year for me. And that might change year to year what I focus on the most, but you know, players who are best in role, players who are um, special for certain reasons, players who play a unique style of CS that works really high level, that kind of thing. Okay, so who is this player? Did I already spoil it? I can't remember, I just recorded the demo. It was a good one. This player is somebody who is the only one in this role on this list. That's sort of true. That's sort of kind of true. True and yeah, that's pretty true. That's true and yeah, that's true. That's true. That's true. That's pretty true. That's pretty true. I mean, that's pretty much true. He is somebody who he is undefeated in a certain country in tournaments, literally won them every single time, both times he was there. This is a player who you already know who it is. How, how do I make this? I mean, he's a player who survived losing one of the most important players in the year, picked up a new one and achieved the biggest compliment that a player could ever ask for. I don't know how to beat around the bush anymore, guys. The player that is number 60 in the world for me this year is Jame. And the reason he isn't higher, honestly, is just because Antwerp wasn't that strong for him. Rio was unreal, but it was just recent, right? That's a huge thing. Um, he had a very good year. And actually, you know, you've got to give him even more points for the fact that, I mean, just he's such a defining player. And I think he really embodies this list in, all, in a lot of ways where it's a guy who you can't replace him. He is a player who is the team in many respects. He's the guy who, man, in terms of peer reviewed, one of the biggest players player that I've ever kind of talked about. Like everybody who's played with him and I talk to you Kinder all the time at events. He's so much to say about Jame, um, how smart he is and everything like that. And he survived losing a Kinder, picking up fame and making it look like they never, you know, they never, they never slowed down at all. I mean, it's unreal. You know, Flick comes in, unbelievable Rio, uh, Kickert and Fame end up taking, splitting the roles for Yakinder. Uh, Yakinder, one of the most unreal players that you could possibly lose. Um, and they, they actually just win the major. Unbelievable. Um, we're here to talk about James T side of Dust 2, which I feel like is one of his most hallmark, hallmark positions. Also, just rest in peace, Dust 2. We'll never see it again. So why not pay homage a little bit here? and bring it into the top 20 list maybe as many times as we can. But this is the player for me that explains and displays the importance of information on uh, T-Side Dust 2. This demo was great, by the way. I just recorded it, worth a watch. We're gonna see how he controls mid, how he games rotations, how he makes people uncomfortable, makes teams scared, and almost always picks the right site. So let's hop on in, Jame number 16. Yep, it's me, it's Jame. Okay, tech pause. I wanted to watch this match uh, specifically because I casted it. I checked the console and I am a caster in this match. And you know what? Um, you would think, oh, that's so cool. I could talk about what happened. I don't remember. I didn't even know I cast this until I downloaded a demo. I don't remember a single round from this game. I watched a few demos in preparation for Jame T side here. It has been something that I've been talking about kind of all year, actually. Uh, but haven't really looked at, and that is Jame using information to win rounds on T-side of Dust2. And a lot of his, the way that he approaches these rounds, we're going to pay attention to in this game. I think that's something I want to continue to do, actually give you guys a few things to passively watch that I'm watching for that I don't think, that I don't think as much about, but I think is really important. 
So while I'm just blabbering, you know, there's something to pay attention to. <clears throat> one of those things is always crosshair placement, by the way. James is a bit weird for, with that one because it, it always looks like his sensitivity is like too high for him. And he doesn't, he's such a game sense player, such an intuition player. He's not really always reacting and aiming like right perfectly. Okay, maybe not crosshair placement with James. It's good. It's just, that's not what makes James who he is. Uh, what we want to watch for with James is, especially on this map, what is on his screen? What is in his vision? And um, one, one of the core concepts for Dust 2 and the way that James makes outsiders win Dust 2 uh, for his team is by spotting down mid from suicide, watching it with an op, holding it from Xbox constantly, keeping a tally of how many players he's seen and have crossed. And we're going to see rounds, especially where the other team makes a mistake to his perspective. Okay, let's see how Jim approaches this, actually. Oh, there's no time for the diffuse. We're going to watch uh, rounds where if James gets too much info inside of mid, it's over. If James figures out that there's only one B or two B, it's over. His team will split behind it, okay? Almost all the rounds, looking at some of the data on Starcaller, that James played on this map, he was going by spawn. This one looked like an exception, honestly. It feels like from a lot of the Dusty games that he's recently played, the rounds are called, called out of spawn based on his spawn in some situations, especially when he's just starting B. And it might just be because of other people's spawns and then he organizes, but it, it felt like it had a lot to do with his spawn, even though he's not taking some kind of very fast active role besides when he drops down into Suicide to spot into the door. So um, different approaches here onto mid are what we're going to pay attention to with James. This is a big thing. Looking through this doorway is everything about the way that this team plays on T side. They really trust Jame. And I think as an aside, I, he's such a player's player. Like everybody I've talked to that's played with him in the past, um, that knows him. I talked to you Kinder a lot at events. So much reverence for Jame and what he knows about the game. The best Kinder quote about him that I just got was like, you know, when you start playing with Jame, he doesn't tell you everything. He just lets you know what you're doing wrong sometimes, and he slowly reveals his secrets, okay? This is this is your kinder. Everyone's learning from your kinder these days. But he's the one talking up James. James, major MVP this year. Can't be understated. Uh, IGL, major MVP. One of the best snipers in the game, in a game with unreal snipers. And he didn't have a great Antwerp. Um, there were... You know, the, like the, the the whole year wasn't amazing. Overall, pretty damn good. A spat, like definitely top twenty stats and everything. But if you just want to look at Rio, for example, there there's a bit of recency there. Rio was particularly strong as an event, and also we may find out. Actually, I don't know if we will know because they beat Heroic in the final. That was the best team they beat on their run, and then Heroic obviously had an incredible blast fall final and showed then became number one team in the world with the absence of outsiders there which they'll be testing uh, at the world final. I've been trying to record some of these before I leave because you got the nice camera setup and everything. I want to, you know, get ahead of it too so I can focus on casting. So we won't be including that, but uh, that was the best team that they beat at Rio. And so I'm not doing that to knock the run uh, at all. I, I, I actually, it's, it's a really annoying conversation sometimes when people try to do that to talk about how weak somebody was. It's a fair thing to point out that they didn't face everybody. They didn't beat Navi, they didn't beat Cloud9, they didn't beat phase to uh get their rio major but they did beat everybody in front of them and they took out heroic in the grand finals which was arguably the best team they had to play at that time and as we can see from one event later from heroic they were the real deal coming into that final um and this this was a very big win and a great st a strong opponent to be able to take down in the, in the grand final as well and jane was the guy stats leader caller of the event Dude was amazing on Dust2 as a caller, in my opinion. Dust2 T side, overpass, CT side, the 15-0 versus Fnatic into 16-1, I think, on overpass. We actually watched the demo on that following the major. Up in hand, jumping down into suicide and doing it off of Kicker's head to spot for the lower cross. Important to get a little bit of elevation here. Very simple thing, but you, you, somebody can cross under your guys if you're not watching this properly. Um... So, and, and not being exposed to the door is huge. Sometimes what James does is he'll turn to the door right after this. He'll just give it a second, then turn to the door. He's obsessed with finding out what's through that doorway. 
Let's see if he tries it. But for now, he's just making sure no one can get to his teammates in lore. And there it is. Checks the door. Always risky, but you know what? That's one way to kill Jam. You just... You're not going to see him do this a lot, so you can't can't hold for this every round. In fact, most of the rounds he's doing this. He's jump spotting from the left side of Suicide. And what's key about that, actually, something I would like to point out, is that jump spotting is the single most effective way to get information at a high level safely. All right, this jump spot inside of uh, Suicide to see through the mid doors. This is the most important. I know this map is dead, doesn't exist anymore, but this is what, this is something that can maybe apply to other maps, and it's just such a core concept on Dust 2. And this map has a storied history. We can't just forget about it. We're going to talk about it a little bit, okay? Cuts right... This is the reason Dust 2 is so infamous, so famous. It depends on how you look at it, what lens you've got on. But this cut right through the middle of the map, the fact that the action starts right at the beginning of the round... And funnily enough, they dropped the Tetris block down here to slow that down. It didn't really slow anything down. It just actually made Dusty more dynamic. It was a great change. Ironically, only made it so you used more nades inside a middle. Only made it so you had to be more creative with the cross, how you approach things. But didn't make it so that people stopped dying on the cross, which I think was the initial intended change. People found ways to get down there quick and still get their op shots off. But that's what's made Dusty, I think, famous and fun. For, every, for all levels, right? But uh, it's also just what's really important to keep tabs on, even if you're not going to take that shot. So again, James, most of the time, he's just jump spotting very carefully in this area. Jump spotting is the most effective, safest way to get lots of info fast. And even though you could die, the reason that people will exclaim when they get killed on a jump spot a caster i'm casting someone gets killed on a jump spot oh amazing the reason that's amazing is because it's a hard shot and it's normally not hit most of the time even if you die that 10 percent of the time or even less probably less on the jump spot the other nine out of ten times or whatever it is you are getting round changing information in a way that wouldn't be safe otherwise holding an angle waiting to get flashed that kind of thing Sitting, jump spotting, very key thing. Lots of parts of different maps have jump spots. Look for where people are jump spotting. Do not sleep on jump spotting, okay? Jump spotting is a very important part of Counter-Strike. Um, especially on Dust2. Rest in peace. Look at this. Obsessed. We're cutting the map in half. And again, what's... One thing that can be trivialized is rotating back and forth here on the CT side. You have to give something exchange. So that's why Jame sees this as a massive opportunity to always try to keep eyes here, especially with an op. If you can hold this angle, then they have to give him something back. If they don't cross and he got that early info on suicide, then he can call what the setup is going to be. If the CTs are scared, that's going to show. If they're not playing inside a mid, that's going to show. And if they don't do anything and they don't have some sick kind of overstack early in the round and it went underneath, uh, you know, James didn't see it, then they're going to get called out and you're going to get bullied for it. And that is, that is again, that is what James does. That's what he loves to do. So Goose Molly, we have this smoke that's very important for the attack on the cross. It's a one-way, so your op and riflers can stay above it. They can crouch beside it, take some more unfavorable fights with the CTs on the A site, on the ramp. This is the hard part of the cross, of course. Once you get to the box, you're actually safe. Um, if Kicker looks down and crosses wide enough, he can't be seen. There's going to be gaps. This is obviously a hard shot from, from Wonderful, but you know, try to be as safe as you can in that position because the oppers are getting better every day. And James is great in this spot as long as they know no one's coming up cat and we've got one in lower. So wonderful. He doesn't necessarily have to approach by swinging into this. Um, oh. Eh, well, that's going to be a little harder now. Yeah. Wow. Great round, Magics. That's our boy. Okay. We're going to pay attention here again. And also, it's not about one way that's the best when it comes to how you hold the pick. Uh, it's about tendencies. I've also got a little bit of thing about tendencies, okay? 
especially playing at a lower level you're playing like your ESEA main whatever mixed team type thing you're watching a demo to prepare for a team at a pro level people have lots of ways to play sites but even still even at that level people everyone has tendencies people are human people have tendencies and if you watch somebody on how they play their site at a lower level there's going to be about three ways they play it right two they play a lot one they throw in there every once in a while uh you need to pay attention to what those things are and then don't overthink and just attack those tendencies when you're entering when you're trying to fight into a site people will surprise you at how simple they keep it no this don't ever assume that after you watch the demo oh i found the three ways they're going to play it but this guy's a mastermind he's going to be 10 steps ahead he's going to change his spots up add five more no he's not he's going to play the exact same way he knows how and the worse that he plays in that game as you bully him more the more he's going to go back to his favorite spots and then that's when you're going to get him even even worse that's when you're going to send him to pound town okay so always play off of tendencies and never overestimate your opponents actually everyone says don't underestimate don't overest don't overestimate a gamer okay they will do the same thing twice. So sometimes James will go grab this info here and then he'll come around to mid, almost never coming out late long unless they're going for the full attack. But then coming in mid, Kicker will swing in front of him when James wants to approach into mid and James can swing behind it, try to trade out. Kicker plays very sacrificially here or selflessly, I should say, when it comes to trying to help him. And you can see they'll line up the peak right now. And they'll ready up for a trade inside of middle. There's nothing here. And again, trying to safely get this info. See that flash? That flash is an expenditure from the CT side to ensure that it's unclear. It's dubious. How many players are in B? How many have crossed up? If there's someone playing close door and the T's have to figure out if they want to molly close door, if they want to walk out mid because they think it's a bluff, they think it's a 3-2. This is the whole game on Dust 2. That's why we're watching Jame. And that's why it all looks so boring. But look how much he values getting this information. There's a small streak of rounds won by Spirit in the beginning of this, round, in the beginning of this game. In a very close match overall. But a good match from Jame and a decent T side overall. So there it is. There's that kill from an insecure CT side, right? No door smoke. No players spotting back towards the T side and as much as it's oh it's scary for the T's they, they haven't seen any CTs think about the CTs they're the ones who are spread out across the back half of the map and aren't playing together look at this pack of wild dogs right here coming up cat they're hungry and there's only one or two people maybe three most here um in this situation of course it could still be three there is wonderful long. It could be a long setup. And they're continuing on with the attack, but 10 seconds left. And they were ready to explode. Jame got that kill, I guess, after they committed. So I was thinking that actually might be a round that they want to go back mid B. And it looks like actually, yeah. Okay. So this this ends up being a round where the info comes a little late. And that's why actually Patsy's move, maybe it wasn't a mistake. Because Jame got that kill, but he couldn't act on it by doing the snap call and having everyone organized for the mid B. And in that moment, maybe he thought, oh shit, it's probably a 3-2. We still got to try to do this. At least we have a 5v4 advantage. So he did that again. Left side, lower into mid doors, the spot. A few more jump spots, watching for the cap push. We have seen Wonderful play uh, on long. Ooh, a bit of a bait for Jame to try to do anything to get the opper to come out in his direction. They could be still holding from pit and just waiting. So here they can put pressure on Wonderful via cat as well and make it so that this area here inside of long, if you were here, ooh, this is actually a scary position right now for uh, the CT side. They let them get up cat. Patsy's late to see mid. I don't know if you see anybody right now. Uh, Jame is putting pressure on Magix, who can't cross up. Chopper is relatively alone. Magix can cr can flash for Chopper. But in this position, this is the most stress possible on Chopper. He has to frag out. Oh, Patsy does clip one. Leave it to Patsy. It looked like he was a little late there. 
and they don't change up. This is interesting. No info gained. Uh, and James just goes back to holding onto the flank, I guess, because of this Patsy kill. They're worried about it. Oh. That's still from left side mid. And one cross is right. Ah. Oh, Patsy goes back. And there it is. There it is. Look at the call. They thought that right there, it was... That instantly a call was going to be made. Then they fake mid B to try to maybe pull Chopper into CT spawn. Get the CT scared. I just accidentally fast forwarded one second. So James just plays with Patsy. He gets spotted left side. James comes back to the right. And now he has him locked off. Patsy gets uncomfortable with the idea of giving up this info guaranteed. And then what happens? Boom. He tries to cross back. James goes and calls everyone down mid. But instead actually goes back into their original plan. This is a very risky move by James. But this is the moment where the CTs will make that mistake more often than not. And think, oh crap, we got to move fast. So he put, could pull Chopper off the A site. James gets his on Magus, who's getting pulled out of the pit because he thinks no way he came back. Amazing attempt by James for the second shot. It's a thought that counts right there. He does get the info, and the trade comes through, and the round is actually won because of this. And Magic is pissed. He thinks there's no way this man would come back to long this late into the round, and it ends up winning the round. Okay. How many kills am I going to miss here? This is actually such a massive round um, out of James. Okay, so this is what happened here is the, the smoke actually just went a bit too far. You're sp they're supposed to be able to put the smoke down, put your back to it, walk out, fight the ramp. Um, and then instead what happens in front of James, or if I remember correctly anyways, uh, it, he just he's able to see them, I think. I don't think it was a blind shot. Yeah, it's just too far. And it would have been fine if James was in the pit, um, but he was right there on the corner. That was a pretty fantastic round out of James. So we got a little bit of a change up in play, right? James not going to mid this time for the first time in his life. Uh, they're actually looking to go fast in a B. Uh, looks like they're trying to get the CTs to overreact to some of the, the plays that have come out in these last few rounds. And they're attacking, you know, with a lot of force here as well. And if you get the B site and you get your two trades, that's it. 3v3 is in with B site control. I mean, you would rather be the T side every time. I don't even care if you have tech nines. If two guns get dropped on the site, you got your two kills, you're down 3v3. You want to be the T's all the time. Post planning in the B site is the, one of the most fun things you can do in CS. So easy. You go big box, you get someone to play car, you keep tunnels control. Whatever you want to do, you're going to win every time. But getting in the site is one of the hardest things. And see, even Mastermind Jame here is splitting the difference. Not always up in the cross, always up in the jump, always opping low. You change it up. This is a close flash for the doors, so Kicker can clean it out. As we like to say in the biz. Anyone close doors can cause big problems if you're going up cat. Later on in the rounds. And now they're really making the CTs uncomfortable by going out and throwing nades deep into CT, showing that they had control of it. So even though they're not using it here. Well, let's see if this actually scores some movement from the CTs. They're 5v4, so they shouldn't be too scared. You can see James constantly like, oh, let me just check one more time. Let me just see. Maybe they're going to make a mistake. This Patsy's going to give me the peak. He's going to give me the peak. They're trying to confuse him, trying to scare him. Oh, J oh he's, he was looking for the close flash again. There are definitely some mind games going on right now. Okay. Now, James' job is almost done here. One supporting flash. Op, he's going to chill. He's waiting for his teammates to make the move. They're reloading on the smoke. They get the trades. Great entry pack here on Outsiders. Can't just give game, James all the credit. Especially Flit. My God, what a tournament. And fame, of course. 3v3, I said you want to be the T's every time. Let's find out if that's true. Yo. Uh -oh. Well, 
Norbert? Oh, it's done. Wow. Well handled by Norby. There it is. One guy shows himself out mid. That's the info. That's what I'm talking about right there with the jump spot. If someone's opping behind it and he was and Jane was opping low, he would either miss a player right there or die trying to kill one. You know? So that's where jump spotting is just the best thing you can do sometimes. Simply the just the best option that you have in CS. It's really powerful. It looks kind of like it can be messy on paper, right? Because it's like jump spotting, you're not able to shoot back, you're missing you're missing all these gaps and timings. But when you're the one trying to update the info yourself, you're trying to actively get info for yourself, that's one of the best ways. Or am I contradicting? Did I just say the best way? Maybe it just said the best way. It's just the best way. Owned. Oh, wonderful. He spent all his time at A. The one time he comes to play games in mid, the game gets played on him. Give me all your stuff. I don't know what happened, but they own this round. It's over. Oh, wonderful. The second time he tries to go, goes for a different peak with a player crossing in front of him. James doesn't bite. And then he takes him out again. Massive. Oh, they jump back as well. And guess what? James was just sitting there the whole time waiting. Oh, what a shot. Wow, what a sh damn. Patsy? Wow. Man, look how look how that changes things up, right? James had the dominant angle there, plus the 5v4, and they try to pick up the op. If he got that kill, it was over. And now in this situation, it's just totally even. So it's up to the rest of the cronies to figure this out. We're here to watch the James. Wow, they tried it again. And James kind of went... He like gambled, it was like rock, paper, scissors, and he gambled right three times in a row right there. They did come to peek him each time. But you can see here that Spirit have put now an emphasis on trying to stop this info. They're like, let's get some back. Let's fight for mid a little more. Patsy, I know you're great with that rifle, but let's not have you just swing out into mid over and over again. That's too risky. Let's send Wonderful in. But overall, it's been much better um, much better for James than it has been for him. Okay, I'm just skipping everything. It's fine. Oh! Look at that. The king of information. Is that one tagged in lower? Did he get to escape? Flit's holding it. Oh! There was two, actually. And Siren goes down. But Magix is still alive. Patsy, he's been fearsome. That was a nice shot. But this sandstone, what is the building made of? Helps cover James. So he's safe. Three on three towards the A site. And Norbert gets the swing frag here. Opens the A site. Bomb crosses up. And we're going to assume this is over. Okay, I, I really am skipping everything. I mean, you know what this kill looks like. It's not like it, it's just. For the integrity of the demo, I feel like I've actually skipped through 15 kills, even though they weren't all that. There weren't, like, any special ones. We kind of... You could see them coming. But let's just, for the sake of it... Come on. Here's what they have to go for. it. Easy. And Kicker lots it up, finally. That was a meaty demo. That had a lot of good stuff in there. Too bad it's all useless because Dust 2 is out. That's Jame. Uh, for me, the player who I think... I mean, just incredible. The fact that he did it. IGLing with fame. I'll talk about this in the intro. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed that. Number 16 player of the year. Who do you think is number 15? Let me know in the comments below.